the God who is 24-7, 365. I typed into the Google search engine work, 24-7, 365, and the top hits that came were associated with Reddit. Now, I know that many of you are familiar with Reddit. Reddit is uh, something of a social network platform. It describes itself as a network of communities where people can dive into their interests and hobbies and passions, whatever you're interested in. And there's just, well, well the topics are almost endless. Sports and business and animals and pets. Philosophy, spirituality and religion, travel, history, fashion, law, music, military, politics, and on and on and on it goes where people talk about whatever they are interested in. But when it comes to that work, 24-7, 365, here are some of the posts that I read. It's honestly making me hate my life because I'm tied down to this phone like a prison. It isn't human. These companies, in my opinion, are being completely unethical in their 27, their 24-7 on-call expectations with very little pay. And in my case, when I originally came, there was no on-call expectations. Are you tracking here with this person? It's even made it hard for me to interview at other jobs. People keep telling me not to quit until I have another job lined up. But honestly, I can't take this anymore. You think I would be an idiot for just quitting and trying to find a job with the free time I have? Okay, that's one person venting on Reddit. So another post was actually not of the actual individual who was involved in on-call, but it was a child, I'm assuming an adult child of the person, his dad, who is on-call a lot. My dad is an OBGYN and has been on-call roughly one-third one -third of the year now for 35 years. He gets by because my mom is very good at organizing every aspect of his life that isn't work-related. He handles income and vacations. She does essentially everything else. He gets a call most nights and has to go into the hospital a third to a half of the time at least once. There's times that he'll do an eight-hour day, get called back in shortly after coming home, and then not get back home until 4 a.m., only to go back in at 8 o'clock and do it all over again. 80 to 100 hour weeks are common. It's a horrific schedule. He's been doing it for a long time. The way he makes it work is this. You eat at 6 and you go to bed at 10 no matter what. Breakfast and lunch are exactly the same time every day. The only way you deviate from this is if you are in surgery. This is then followed by 6 weeks of vacation a year and a hefty salary. The golden handcuffs, he writes. <laughs> well, here's one other. I was on call every other week and received $128 a week for being on call. $1 an hour. Now, that's quite a bit different than the OBGYN, right? Rarely was I called, but I could not leave town and I had to carry a pager everywhere? When I was called, it was usually between 2 and 5 a.m. or on the weekend. If I had out-of-town guests, it would completely blow their visit apart. My time was never, rarely, ever my own. I was responsible all the time. I moved on after nearly two years of this routine, stuck in a cube bill which has now burnt me out and left me miserable. I will never accept a job again that demands such availability or connectivity. 24-7, 365, on call. There's a lot of them out there. Some of you may be familiar with a book entitled The 36-Hour Day. 
It's directed towards caregivers, family of those who have a loved one who is dealing with Alzheimer's or some type of dementia. If you're not familiar with the 36-hour day, you can only imagine what this book goes into. The nonstop, incessant, having to be available and take care of immediate needs. This book, The 36-Hour Day, claims to help family members and caregivers address those challenges and simultaneously cope with their own emotions and needs. What might God's on call look like? What might it feel like for God to be on call 24-7 and Kevin, little quirky as he is, read the title in the up-to-date for today's message and he texted me, well, this year it's 24-7, 366 because February this year has how many days? 29. And I texted back, okay, how about 24-7 slash infinity? <laughs> Let's dip in for a few moments to Psalm 78 and just kind of get a feel through Psalm 78 of what it might be like for God to be on call. In Hebrew fashion, Psalm 78 recalls its sacred history. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable, a story. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength, and his wonderful works that he has done. Now this is classic Hebrew history, recounting the past, looking at the past to gain value for it from today. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. Why? That they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Do not be like our fathers. Marvelous things he did in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through and he made the water stand up like a heap. In the daytime also, he led them with a cloud, and at night with a light of fire. He split the rock in the wilderness and gave them their drink in abundance like the depths. He also brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. But what do you think comes next? But... They sinned even more against him by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. And they tested God in their heart, asking for the food of their fancy. Yes, they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he struck the rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. But can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? Therefore, the Lord heard this and was what? Furious! God's on call. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel because they did not believe in God 
and did not trust in his salvation. Yet, he commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven, had rained down manna on them to eat, and had given them the bread of heaven. Men ate angels' food, and he sent them food to the full. Now, a few decades ago, there was a contemporary Christian vocalist named Keith Green. Anybody remember Keith Green? Thank you. You're dating yourself, Pamela. I know you don't like that, so. <laughs> so he had this song that said, So you want to go back to Egypt? And part of that song talked about the manna and what they did with the manna. Manna waffles, manna burgers, Manna salad, manna fajitas. <laughs> but the Bible calls it angel's food. Then they remembered that God was their rock and the Most High God, the Redeemer. Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouth and they lied to him with their tongue, for their heart was not steadfast with him nor were they faithful in his covenant. But he, he what? But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath for he remembered that they were but flesh. A breath that passes away and does not come again. Psalm 121 says, God never sleeps nor slumbers. God is on call. 24-7 365, 366 to infinity. And we see this arising out of the sanctuary. How? Stay tuned. Through a little word in Hebrew known as tamid. Tamid. In English, it can be translated to number of different ways referring to something that is at all times. It's continually, it's ever going on. It's perpetual. It's regular. It's daily. And we've already looked at many of the things that are actually tamid. We've looked at the daily burnt offering. Every day was offered in the temple courtyard. That burnt offering, a one-year-old male lamb, morning and evening, twice a day, every day. And we've looked at that and the significance of it, its spiritual meaning that it was a vivid portrayal of the daily, the continual dependence upon sacrifice as a means of God dwelling with them as a nation, a community, and individually. The burnt offering operated under the assumption that human beings are not holy by nature. And consequently, when they approach the Lord, even to express gratitude, joy, thanksgiving, they are in constant need of forgiveness. Tamid, continual, daily. We've not looked at this in detail yet, but many of you are familiar with the bread of presence. It was placed fresh every Sabbath. Now, that's not necessarily every day, but it's ongoing, it's continual. It was in a cycle of weekly renewal. And it was an acknowledgement of the continual provision of spiritual and physical life and food that comes from this God who wants to dwell with us. The lampstand was to burn continually. And it was an acknowledgement of the continual provision of spiritual life provided to the community. There's the altar of incense perpetual incense before the Lord. In Exodus 30, it instructs Moses to take fragrant spices, and you can look at 
the, the, the list of spices that are there. And you shall regard this as holy to the Lord. And it was to be burning. It was to be wafting continually as a sensory experience of the Lord's presence. It has been pointed out by some that with the incense, and specifically with the priest, but it has overlapping significance for us, that in the offering of the incense, the priest was brought more directly into the presence of God than in any other act of the daily ministration. As the inner veil of the sanctuary did not extend to the top of the structure, the glory of God, which was manifested above, the mercy seat was partially visible from that first apartment. In other words, there was light that came from the most holy place that would waft over into that larger section of the tabernacle. The incense ascending with the prayers of Israel represents the merits and intercession of Christ, His perfect righteousness, which through faith is imputed to His people and which can alone make the worship of sinful beings acceptable to God. Ongoing, continual, tamid. By blood and by incense, God was to be approached. Symbols pointing to the great mediator through whom sinners may approach Jehovah and through whom alone mercy and salvation can be granted to the repentant, believing soul. Are you seeing a pattern here? The burnt offering was tamid, it was continual. The bread of presence is continual, it's weekly, it's fresh. The lampstand is to be burning continually. The altar of incense, the intercession is to be continual. But it even extends to the garments of the high priest that we've looked at in some detail. The high priest wore this breastplate bearing the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart as a memorial before the Lord continually. And on his turban there was a little plate, holiness to the Lord. And it shall always be on his forehead that they, the worshipers in their general sinful humanness, may be accepted before the Lord. So Tamid, and this is not all, this is just a sample of what we find in the wilderness sanctuary, refers to the various aspects of Christ's sacrifice and His intercessory, mediatory ministry. We have a God who is 24-7, 365, into infinity, and that arises out of a detailed investigation of the sanctuary where God wants to dwell with us. Just a snapshot of what it's like for God to be on call. Did you know that in the New Testament, we read in John 1, 14, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father. What was it like for Jesus to be on call? Look at some of the examples we find in Jesus' life and how being on call was draining for him as a human being. I think most of you are familiar with that story in the Gospels of a very busy day that Jesus had early in his Galilean ministry. You can find this in Mark 4 as well as Matthew 8. Very busy day. And Jesus is exhausted, so exhausted that he goes to sleep in the boat and the storm happens on the lake and Jesus is just sleeping in the boat as the rain is coming down and the boat is going back and forth. Matthew 8 talks about it like this, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. That's hard to believe. I think I would have wakened up. And it wasn't until the disciples cried out, Lord, save us. Do you not care if we perish? That he finally woke up. B. 
being on call for Jesus was physically draining. But it wasn't just the physical aspects. It carried over into other aspects of well, as well. We see another example of this from Mark chapter 6. The disciples have come back from their own ministry tour. In fact, their inaugural ministry tour where Jesus had sent them out two by two. And Jesus received them back and he heard all about their experiences. And so then he says to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. But the multitudes saw their departing. And many knew and ran there on foot from all the cities. And they arrived before them and came together to him. And what does Jesus say? I'm not available tomorrow. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. On call. On call. It wasn't just ministry to those who were gratefully receiving it, but being on call was also exhausting for Jesus from the standpoint that there were some, and you're pretty familiar with them, who did not like Jesus, who were always attempting to trip him up and who were always trying to get him to implicate himself so that they could make accusations. And they were not hesitant to allege very insulting things. The Pharisees on this occasion, Matthew chapter 12, when they heard it, they said, this fellow, that's actually a very derogatory term, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Can you imagine vocalizing an insult like that to the creator of the universe? And on another occasion, John 10 records a statement made by Jesus' critics. He has a demon and is mad. It's exhausting. But Jesus was actually drained at times by his own disciples. <laughs> Those to whom he was mentoring. Matthew chapter 17 there's a man that comes to Jesus with his epileptic son and he cries out first to his disciples who he is appealing to them to heal his son but they cannot and Jesus walks up and the desperate father cries out, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. And Jesus' response initially was not to the father, but to his disciples. You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Now, <clears throat> I say this very humbly because we know that in Hebrews chapter 4, it tells us that Jesus was tempted in all points like we are, right? But not without, with sin. I think he came real close here. <laughs> it was draining. For Jesus. And maybe so even more on this particular occasion, because the night before, Jesus, along with Peter, James, and John, had been atop the Mount of Transfiguration where Moses and Elijah came down and visited with Jesus appearing in glorious splendor. And as Luke 9 gives us the record, Moses and Elijah spoke to Jesus about his departure, which is 
a very neutral term that is actually translated exodus in the New Testament, which is a euphemistic way of speaking about his crucifixion to come. And we've wondered at times about the significance of Moses and Elijah, two high-profile prophets, leaders, who experienced a great deal of stress. And we don't have a verbatim report of what they spoke to Jesus about, but I can only imagine that it was something along these lines. Jesus, you can do it. You can finish. You gave us grace to finish in our day, our generation. You can finish. I believe that the driving factor in Jesus' prayer life is that he experienced such stress and drain in the interaction with people in ministry that he had to have solitude. It was absolutely required. He had to have solitude with his Father in prayer. Now, all of that, all of that helps us to see in a new context what we read about Jesus's Tamid ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. I referred to Hebrews chapter 4 just a few moments ago. We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The continual of the high priest, the continual of everything we've seen in the wilderness sanctuary points to the continual that is provided for us today. Hebrews chapter 7, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing, but he continues forever, speaking about Jesus. He has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. He continues forever. He always lives. He is our 24-7, 365 into infinity high priest. Now, one who had a very intimate relational experience with Jesus and an amazing grasp of Scripture makes these observations about Jesus' high priestly ministry, his tamid, the significance of his mediatorial ministry. Christ is the connecting link between God and man. He has promised by his personal intercession by employing his name. He places the whole virtue of his righteousness on the side of the suppliant. I had to look that word up just to refresh myself with what it means. He places the whole virtue of his righteousness on the side of the person who makes a humble plea. As we acknowledge before God our appreciation of Christ's merits, Fragrance is given to our intercessions. Oh, who can value this great mercy and love? He places us close by His side, encircling us with His human arm, while His divine arm grasps the throne of the infinite. Is that not beautiful? We've looked at this observation before, but it's worthy of repetition. The sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work in behalf of men. It concerns every living soul upon the earth. It opens to view 
the plan of redemption, bringing us down to the very close of time and revealing the triumphant issue of the contest between righteousness and sin. We have a God who is 24-7, 365 for us. He always lives to make intercession for us. And so many beautiful promises are connected to his Tamid. Here's just one. Philippians chapter 1. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Our God is continual in our behalf. What is our response? Do we have a Tamid response? Yes, we do. Psalm 34 I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise, church family, how often? His praise shall continually be in my mouth. 